next week. Thanks for that, um, Michael. I will try to live up to it, though I will fail. Um, it's nice to be here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is uh, a piece of that project that uh, Michael was just naming and describing uh, lyric poetry and the philosophy of mind, and it's a project that really did uh, begin here. So it's nice to um, bring some of it uh, here to try out um, on all of you. So experimental writing, experimental thinking. What do we mean when we call poetry experimental? The term experimental poetry is, roughly speaking, 194 years old. Robert Southey wrote to Carolyn Bowles that he was working on an experimental poem in 1821. He was referring, of course, to the royalist fantasy, a vision of judgment. And it was experimental, not so much because it imagined George III greeting George Washington before the gates of heaven, honoring each in the other kindred courage and virtue and cognate knowledge and freedom, which is surely an experiment in the boundaries of credulity and taste, but because it was written in hexameters, in a language without quantity. The idea of experimental poetry is much older, perhaps 22 years older. Famously, Wordsworth understood his work in lyrical ballads as materially different from those upon which general approbation is at present bestowed. And he presented that material difference as an experiment in the possible scope of form's rational application. An experiment which, I hoped, might be of some use to ascertain how far, by fitting to metrical arrangement a selection of the real language of men in a state of vivid sensation, that sort of pleasure and that quantity of pleasure may be imparted, which a poet may rationally endeavor to impart. In his 1798 review, Southey declared Wordsworth's experiment a failure, not because the language of conversation is little adapted to the purposes of poetic pleasure, but because it has been tried on uninteresting subjects. Steve Burt, in a recent conversation with Charles Bernstein on experimental poetry, has recently restaked a description of experiment on similarly formal grounds. On his account, to recognize something as experimental required that we vary one aspect of it against a stable control. Metrical innovation against a background of convention provides the best analog for that. But a now obligatory engram confirms what we may already have suspected. Apart from this blip of the early 19th century in which a both monarchist and revolutionary poet could see their formal innovations as experimental, the idea of experimental poetry as a general practice belongs to the avant-garde, or perhaps more precisely and more interestingly, to their demise. This is to say that the term is one among several designating the transformation of the modernist impulse in poetry since the 1930s, one that seeks to appropriate less the formal than the social excitement of the historical avant-garde, but without being beholden to the particular tenor of its politics, however we understand them, and without hopefully suffering its fate, whatever we regard that fate to have been. And here, um, you see a raft uh, of terms that have been graphed, experimental poetry, uh, experimental poem, experimental novel, experimental fiction, experimental literature, and experimental writing. Um, the experimental poetry, there's the yellow blip that I was um, just talking about. And although I'm aware of going too far uh, in drawing conclusions from the data that a tool like this one makes available, um, I can call your attention to a few other results that seem reasonably robust. The 1880 publication, for example, of Zola's Le Roman Experimental led to a consideration of the relation between observational and experimental science um, and the realist novel. The outlier, that big purple one, experimental literature, tracks the rise of psychology as an experimental science. So let us consult the experimental literature is the context in which that um, ever-growing graph um, appears. The most salient are experimental poetry and its rise since the 30s and 40s, and the generally accelerating pace of experimental writing 
since it's one of the features of considering poetry as experimental, that we take it out of its traditional generic confines and consider it as part of a general writing practice. On this account, viewing it as a kind of continuation of an avant-garde impulse, but without desiring to suffer the fate of the avant-gardes, as the name for an aesthetic tendency understood in part negatively, as a subtraction of ambitions and an evasion of disappointments, the specificity of the experimental might seem to have no necessary relation to form, and indeed it might seem to have no necessary content at all, other than perhaps to identify something about the national temperament, a loose and informal survey of the present state of play among contemporary writers suggests that pragmatic Americans have a slight preference for describing poetry as experimental, while the British have by and large preferred innovative for its cognate poetries, preeminently those clustered around the neo-modernist Cambridge School. In an experiment with extending this distinction, some speculative interest, though, but without present, pretending to an exhaustive survey, I will offer a sweeping generalization in place of an argument. Here it is. Recent poetry that understands itself to be experimental, I declare, takes itself to be aimed not at formal innovation, but at cognitive renovation. This is to generalize the argument put succinctly by Joan Retallick in her usefully named, for my purposes, 2007 essay, What is Experimental Poetry and Why Do We Need It? And she offers us the following set of propositions. A, there is the shock of alterity, or should be. B, there is the pleasure of alterity, or should be. C, we humans with all our conversational structures have yet to invite enough alterity in. And D, experiment is conversation with an interrogative dynamic. Its consequential structures turn on paying attention to what happens when well-designed questions are directed to things we sense but don't really know. These things cannot be known by merely examining our own minds. To take poetry as experimental is to take it as engaging by means of form in what she calls radical epistemology, tying together the exercise of the faculty of conception with the modal idea of possibility. Here's Ritalik again. The launching question of every formal experiment catapults one toward the unknown, often improbable, possible. While Ritalik does not go into detail about what sort of epistemology she has in mind, I want to note two things about radical epistemology. First, the idea that poetic experiments have consequential structures and better and worse designs is not consistent with radical skepticism. While Ritalik specifies that the journey toward possibility most often commences by calling into question our current sense of the probable, the unknown possible is not crucially the same as the unknowable. In other words, whatever novelty experimental poetry produces, and Ritalik's term is alterity, can be of interest if substantive cognitive illumination is at stake. Poetry seeks to drag the dim realm of sense into the bright circle of knowledge, whether descriptive or evaluative, knowledge of what there is or what there should be. At the same time, there is skepticism here, and it is of a rather absolute sort, marshaled against any particular instance of knowing. We humans, with all our conversational structures, have yet to invite enough alterity in. And on her account, the structures of poetic experiment, experiment are only judged consequential in the negative. That is, if their results can be leveraged into a critique of error and false constraint. In that move away from the present state of things, she writes, is an implicit critique of prior blunders, oversights, and limitations. This insistence that experimental outcomes are always and only knowable as a vector away from the present state is why they are most readily available as affects, as shock, and as pleasure, rather than as propositions. A similar sentiment 
underwrites Charles Bernstein's recent and deliberately counterintuitive claim in the other side of that conversation with Bert that I mentioned, claimed to be opposed to experimental poetry because he is interested not in positivist success, but in the affective charge of whatever lies on the other side of failure, a charge that he reconstitutes as a promise without particular content. I'm inclined to grant Ritalik's account of, poetics exper of poetic experiment in the interest of cognitive achievement, special attention, because it concisely articulates the logic behind a ubiquitous disciplinary tendency to preserve the form of ethical sentiment that is coherent only in terms of norms, an attachment to what there should be, and at the same time to regard normativity, the normativity necessary for thought and action, and indeed normativity itself, as a kind of necessity that can be countenanced only under the auspices of endless critique. Michael Warner has recently described Judith Butler's importance to the history of theory as inseparable from her anti-normative stance. In Warner's concise summary, where most accounts of norms imagine an agent who acts on the basis of beliefs or desires and reflects on what ought to be done, Butler called attention to the ways we find ourselves already normatively organized as certain kinds of agents, for example, by having gender in ways that must be intelligible to others. The resulting investment in what Lee Edelman has approvingly called the negativity opposed to every form of social viability has been massively influential. And while there has recently been a push to reconsider the degree to which anti-normative, uh, the anti-normative, has itself become normative for queer theory, the determined embrace of anti-normative knowledge, right, that which is anti-normative and still somehow knowledge, underwrites for example, a whole raft of disciplinary commitments. The commitment of some affect theorists to affect non-normalizable force, which takes embodied feeling as a lever for an ethics of resistance. It defines the speculative realist critique of correlationism and its paradoxical metaphysics, which seek to give an account of what reality must be like, such that it prevents us from giving an account of what it is like. It marks the achievement of Ranciere's poet of the new world, who undoes the chains by which things are held in the utilitarian and monetary order and individuals held in the role that society expects of them. Ritalik's investment, interest in, emphasis on formal innovation in the interest of cognitive achievement places a particularly uh, explicit spin on the problem of normativity. If poetry's virtue is best understood as a weapon against epistemic complacency, then in an incompletely argued equation, epistemic complacency is itself the seat of vice, the engine of a culpable complicity. This makes the problem of complicity into something like a theoretical problem before it is a practical problem. And I should say, I don't honestly know if that's right. Um, I don't know that it's wrong. Um, uh, but if the problems of complicity uh, are best understood as failures of knowledge um, rather than of failures of will, um, uh, that's an interesting outcome. And it does seem to be a pervasive thought. And so that's why I'm going to deal with it here. I propose to tarry with Ritalik's insistence that whatever it is that poetry has to contribute to the question cannot be known by merely examining our own minds. This is in part to ally poetic experimentation with scientific experimentation by uh, uh, soliciting its spirit of world engagement against confessional self-absorption. But it is as forcefully to pit poetic experimentation against another experimental tradition, the tradition of the philosophical thought experiment. Thought experiments, those devices of the imagination used to investigate the nature of things, are notoriously conducted precisely by examining our own minds. The original notion of the Gedanken experiment was understood by Ernest Mach as a necessary part of experimental design, preceding the physical experiment and preparing the way for it. But all of those Baroque little fictions involving fat men and trolleys, zombies and swamp men, teletransportation and Chinese rooms are not precursors for some particularly fantastic 
or sadistic form of lab work. They are the experiments themselves. And as such, they aim at leveraging our apparently already existing beliefs about imagined scenarios that we have never before encountered into knowledge about ethics or even about the causal structure of the world. Ritalik's problem with them is in some sense precisely where it ought to be. For the great mystery of the thought experiment is how the thinker is supposed to sit in a chair and without acquiring any new data, come to know something other than what was already known before sitting down. And yet we might also say that this is an odd place for a poet to discover that she has a problem. For if the poet, as Blackmer suggested, adds to the stock of available reality, then it would seem that whatever he adds has to be something that came from inside the head. Ritalik presents the grounds for her hostility to thought experimentation with performative vigor in her poem, The Woman in the Chinese Room, from her 1998 volume, How to Do Things with Words. And this poem takes off from what is perhaps the most famous thought experiment in the last 30 or so years, John Searle's Chinese Room, first presented in his 1980 paper, Minds, Brains, and Programs. In a somewhat later and more concise formulation, the experiment is summarized like this. And I know that many of you um, I will be familiar with this already. Imagine a native speaker who knows no Chinese, locked in a room full of boxes of Chinese symbols, a database, together with a book of instructions for manipulating those symbols, the program. Imagine that people outside the room send in other Chinese symbols, which, unknown to the person in the room, are questions in Chinese, the input. And imagine that by following the instructions in the program, the man in the room is able to pass out Chinese symbols, which are the correct answers to the question, the output. The program enables the person in the room to pass the Turing test for understanding Chinese, but he does not understand a word of Chinese. Searle's experiment has two targets, as is suggested by his handy allegorical key linking the Chinese symbols to a database and the instructions for their manipulation to a program. The experiment is meant first and foremost to tell against the strong version of artificial intelligence that would take whatever is distinctive about the mind to be in principle wholly implementable by a digital computer because what is notionally special about the mind is capable of being understood in computational and functional terms. But if the system that Searle describes, despite being perfectly able to speak Chinese, cannot thereby be said to understand Chinese, or still less, to know Chinese, then a computer, which does nothing more than coordinate systems of inputs and outputs according to more and less concrete and complex algorithms does not know or understand Chinese either. The point being, in other words, that to know or to understand entails more than just properly coordinating inputs and outputs. It entails consciousness, something possessed for whatever reason by human brains, but not by digital symbol manipulators. As I suggested a moment ago, an experiment capable of reaching a conclusion like this one might seem congenial to many poets, even to an experimental poet proudly skeptical of unified accounts of subjectivity. But as the title implies, the woman in the Chinese room suggests that even though the outcome of Searle's experiment may be construed as a defense of conscious life, the form of the experiment itself offers an instance of the constriction or even the abuse of consciousness. This is from the poem. She, how do you know the person locked for all those years in the Chinese room is a woman? There are few, if any, signs. If she exists at all, she is the content of a thought experiment begun in a man's mind. This is nothing new and perhaps more complicated. Imagine that you are locked in a room. In this room, there are several baskets full of Chinese characters. She is glad they are Chinese, of course, glad to continue Pound's Orientalism. There will be no punctuated vanishing points. She is given only rules of syntax, not semantic rules. She is relieved of the burden of making meaning. She need only make sense for the food to be pushed through the slot in the door. It is thought that these are situations more familiar than we would like it to be in the new technologies and to men more than to women, but it oddly feels quite normal. 
Before I say much about this poem, I'd like to put one more poem on the table. It turns out that there is a minor genre of thought experiment poems. Maybe there are only two, but surely that's enough to at least imagine a genre. John Beer's Merry Color Scientist from his 2010 volume, audaciously titled The Wasteland and Other Poems, takes up a thought experiment from Frank Jackson's 1982 essay, Epiphenomenal Qualia. And if not quite as much uh, general interest ink has been spilled on this experiment as on Searle's, um, arguably more philosophical ink um, has been directed in its, uh, has been you know, caused by uh, this experiment. In this experiment, we're asked to imagine Mary, the color scientist, born in and forced, for whatever reason, to live out her existence in a black and white room with only a black and white television to view the world through, and no access to any color in her entire life, including, presumably, if somewhat mysteriously, the color of her own body. Mary studies the science of color and in fact knows every physical fact that there is to know about color, about its distribution in the world, about the nature and origin of its phenomenal properties, and of course, um, uh, about the cause of color behaviors, including linguistic ones. And this is Jackson. Just which wavelength combinations from the sky stimulate the retina, and exactly how this produces via the central nervous system the contraction of the vocal cords and the expulsion of air from the lungs that results in the uttering of the sentence, the sky is blue but she has never had an occasion to utter that sentence or any like it because despite her formidable mastery of the facts, she has never actually seen a color. One day, again, for whatever reason, Mary is released from her black and white prison into the world and she sees color for the first time. And the question is this, are Mary's vivid experiences of color a new fact that she has learned when she enters the world? And if so, what does it mean that there is a fact that can only be learned experientially, subjectively, that was not contained in her stipulated understanding of everything about color? Here, as with Searle's Chinese room, the target of what has come to be known as the knowledge argument is an unalloyed physicalism. For if we can assent the idea that, to the idea that Mary learned something new in acquiring this experience, something previously unavailable to her stipulated, if limited, omniscience, then we must acknowledge that an inventory of physical states is not sufficient grounds for all knowledge. Specifically, it is not sufficient for knowledge of conscious states, which must be had and can only be known in the first person. And if an inventory of physical states is not sufficient for knowledge of conscious states, then conscious states cannot be, or cannot only be, physical ones. Here it is in John Beer's witty and plaintive poetic reconstruction of the knowledge argument scenario. Mary worked so long and hard in the palace of black and white. Mary knows things I don't know. She knows every tear I've cried. She gave her life to seeing sight. Mary, Mary, when will you come outside? In Beer's poem, what Mary knows is not just the science of color, but the expansion of the problem or the domain of the problem is not yet in opposition to the problem. For the outcome of the knowledge argument is not limited to the particular set of phenomenal properties that frame the experimental scenario, not limited, in other words, um, to color data, but extends to the whole domain of phenomenal and even to affective life. I don't seem to have uh, the section that I wanted to read, but I'll read it out to you. Snow will fall, turn, day turn to night, and not even postmen evade her sight, lidless, Fulfilling the ancient dream, she sees the tanks roll into Gaza and dieters. She sees with all encompassing eyes the shredding of orders, kids sneaking into the story of O, the football scrimmage, and Manhattan ending. She sees the end of Paris and Fort Worth. She watches subways melt sleeplessly. She knew how it all would work out. 
She trains her dials on the death of kings sitting sadly by the waterfront shacks. She sees beyond the genius of Edward Teller Hopper and Lear. You and I are the trouble she's seen. Mary's lidless eyes evoke the inchoate anxiety of failed lovers from the game of chess section of Eliot's The Wasteland, pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. Her all-encompassing eyes are like those of Tiresias, who has theoretical access to the whole world's warranted misery. Tiresias, remember, is blind and cognitively empowered. On Eliot's telling, he has perceived the scene and foretold the rest. And as with impotent Tiresias, the world of death that Mary knows the theoretical truth of is not one in which she has a full experiential stake and not one in which she is licensed to intervene. Her cognitive empowerment comes at the cost of an experiential sequestration. Or as Beer puts it, Mary, when will you come outside? So what generalizing from our N of two can be said to be at stake in the contemporary poet's reception and revision of the philosophical thought experiment. In both of these poems, it is the prison of philosophical thought itself, not of perception or experience, but of perception and conception conceived as problems within a particular intellectual, methodological, and disciplinary framework that bodies forth by the imprisonment of the figure, right, by the very means, by, by, by the very means with which that thought is pursued and conducted. In both poetic imaginings, the political and ethical problems that are conspicuously not a part of the original thought experiments, whether the problems of Orientalism or the tanks rolling into Gaza, are precisely not the result of people having bad beliefs or false beliefs about culture or about politics. Rather, by tying the forms of suffering to the form of the experiment itself, the problem that the poems address is the problem of being in the grips of bad ways of forming beliefs. To hypothesize that the woman in the Chinese room was a woman all along, that there are relevant facts not in evidence in the scenario, is to indict an intellectual framework in which facts appear only insofar as they are evidence. To stake oneself on the non-evidentiary facts, the ones that exceed those that are strictly necessary or probative for the construction of an experimental scenario, is to discover subjective experience in or as a kind of excess. For if part of the point of Searle's experiment is that mind cannot be realized in just any material form, and maybe not in material form at all, although Searle doesn't go that far, Ritalik's experiment urges us towards a further realization that the metaphysical investment in consciousness as such is hostile to particularized states of being or mindedness, those which cannot be aligned or confined in the scenario of thinking. Searle's scenario, for example, though it points to the irreducibility of the idea that it is like something experientially to be a person, that experiment takes no interest in what it is like experientially to be part of a system that produces effects of understanding while denying its constituent parts the experience of understanding. The nothing new is the status quo for some particular kinds of person. And such experience as do not count as knowledge, do not count as knowledge, should not on this account count as nothing, but rather on Ritalik's view, as everything. For Ritalik, what is absent are those states embodied by particulars, the body of an actual woman, or by groups when considered as culturally or racially non-normative in the silent endurance of the poetically and politically appropriated Chinese. The end of Ritalik's poem seems to present us with a facsimile of what the material components of the translation scenario might look like on the output side. Right? These might be tokens that one could use to build words. If one were not interested in demonstrating something about consciousness, that is to say, not interested in making the room work, but just in looking at it, we find 
an English fractured into its component tiles. Thing, I, ness, inging, hind, a bull, isable, erved, protentending, crack, blank, fast, air, continued, quiet, put, rusted, civet, beast, or breast. This is, on the one hand, mere period style, theoretical prose modulating into paratactically linked sentences and then disintegrating into linguistic fragments. But in joining that style to the particular context of a disciplinary critique, Ritalik bears the conceptual engine behind the equation of linguistic experiment and the sentiment of a vector toward freedom. Just as the content of the poem admits the alterity omitted from the content of the room, the woman in the Chinese room, so too, poetic language preserves the markers of syntax inviolate, protected from the intention-bearing imposition of semantics, as if to pose the question of what neglected life may be in their body, wild or sustaining, beast or breast. Mary, color scientist, on the other hand, was always a woman. But in Beer's version, she is also the Sibyl of Cumae who gave her life to seeing sight. She embodies the trade-off between knowing the world and living in it. Eliot's Wasteland begins by reminding us of the Sibyl's confinement. Beers ends with Mary's release. After she emerged, she saw red, and it was red. She emerged and saw yellow. She saw blue. After she emerged, she saw what green was like. She saw purple and orange. Purple and orange, I want to note, are secondary colors. Um, being both combinatory and vague properties, they're in some sense only available by means of and stabilized with reference to experience. They are non-theoretical admixtures, describable not as a fixed set of wavelengths keyed to our trichromat receptors, as the primary colors are, but as an arbitrary range of wavelengths fuzzing the borders of the primary, subject only to a posteriori judgment. Interestingly, purple and orange are also words that are notorious in English for taking no rhymes. I should note that's only a folk truth about purple. Um, in the course of thinking about this poem, I discovered the word purple, um, which means the hindquarters of a horse. But it seems clear that it's the folk truth that lies behind the selection of these colors. For by hanging the conclusion of the poem on colors that are at once definitionally a posteriori and notionally sonically unparable, Beer seeks to produce, by means of the poetic image, the idea of an experience not susceptible to ideation. A vague color is as experientially vivid and present as a primary one, but it is the notion of vagueness that gives it the force of wildness. And he seeks to produce by means of form the experience of something that belongs to the general category of the non-generalizable, as the unrhymed word seeks to make itself immediately and sensually available, the idea of that which admits no likeness. The poem ends on gray, which might seem a bit anomalous in the context of this reading. Gray is virtually definitionally general being the totality of the range between achromatic extremes. It has no contested borders. Fifty shades of gray are all of them gray. And of course, gray does take a rhyme, or 50, and therefore it makes no great experiential claims to independence. The obvious ending, the one that would continue the thought I've been tracking, would be silver, which would have the advantage both of sonic solitude, not very much, if anything, rhymes with silver, and experiential richness, which is to say that the phenomenal character of silver is unusually sensitive to one's particular position in relation to it. Its iridescence indexes one's own non-theoretical particularity with unusual force. But gray, maybe unlike silver, is both experiential, indeed Mary has always been able to see it, it was perhaps the signature experience of living in the palace of black and white, and theoretical. It makes theoretical and discursive the experience of doing away with the theoretical. For seeing gray 
points us away from the black and white certitudes produced within the enclosures of thought, even as it signifies, however dimly, the nearly but not quite extinguished vividness of the life lived under conditions of intellectual privation. In both of these poems, I've been suggesting, thought experiments that were devised within particular disciplinary contexts to demonstrate, indeed to prove something about the irreducibility of experience to matter, are opposed, as it were, from within by poetic experiments that seek to demonstrate the non-capturability of experience by arguments about experience. This is, for me, a frustrating place to come to because the promise of possibility, the feeling of cognitive success, turns out to hinge on something like the refusal of thought as such. Thought's irreducibly normative character, that which would allow us to draw general conclusions from particular instances to do things with words, does not, it seems, survive the scrupulousness of poetic experimentation. With the time that I have left, I want to gesture, if in a preliminary way, in the direction of some recent philosophical work that might allow us to at least begin to reformulate the idea of experimentation in a way that doesn't end in precisely the same frustration. But I can't promise it won't end in frustration at all. And that presents our imaginative capacities as an engine of real discovery rather than as something like a body or a mute resistance. Rather than discarding the thought experiment on the ground of, it, of its exclusions, we might consider just how it is that thought experiments of the kind that we've been considering are supposed to work. Just how is it, in other words, that something like the knowledge argument, which is, after all, nothing if not a fiction, and as colorful a fiction as one could wish for, black and white though it may be, is supposed to give us access to information about that which is possible or impossible for minds rather than just giving us access, for example, to the content of a story. How is it that the infamous and related zombie argument, the claim that our ability to conceive of creatures who are in every respect identical to human beings, except for the minor detail that they lack consciousness, how is our ability to conceive of philosophical zombies supposed to be sufficient to entail their metaphysical possibilities, and thus the falseness of physicalism with respect to consciousness? David Chalmers, in his 2002 essay, Does Conceivability Entail Possibility? You have to love how the titles of essays do a lot of work for you. Does Conceivability Entail Possibility? Suggest something that on the surface sounds like the fondest dream of Ritalik's experimentalism. We might, he suggests, legitimately move from epistemic premises to modal conclusions, the conclusions about what is or is not possible and from there to metaphysical conclusions. Our ability to conceive of some state of affairs, he suggests, might actually tell us something. Indeed, it might actually entail something about what is metaphysically possible, if we reason carefully enough and in the right way. But what account of conception could be at work here, and what account of possibility? To conceive that some state of affairs is the case is to do more than to assert that it is the case. It is to do more than to merely entertain or suppose the hypothesis that it is so. Chalmers divides the act of conception into six dimensions. Conceivability can be prima facie, a matter of initial appearances and reflections bound to the cognitive limitations of some subject. Or it might be ideal, withstanding the fullest rational scrutiny of a notionally perfect reasoner. Conceivability might be negative in the sense that we have no a priori reasons to rule out some things being the case. Or it might be positive in that we find ourselves capable of coherently imagining a world in which something is the case. And conceivability might be primary, which is to say there might be a very large number of ways that the world, for all we know, actually is, and we may conceive of the world as actually being one of those ways. Or it might be secondary, which is to say that we imagine the world subjunctively, conceiving of some counterfactual way that the world might have been, but is not. We could conceive in a primary sense that we could have had a world in which Hesperus and Phosphorus were not the same. But given the actual world from which we think 
counterfactually, in the secondary sense. It is not possible to conceive of the non-identity of Hesperus and Phosphorus. Their identity is what Kripke called a necessary a posteriori. Chalmers' argument for what he has called modal rationalism makes a strong case that, and I'm going to use his language here, but I'll shortly translate, um, that ideal primary positive conceivability entails possibility in the primary sense. Or, to put it another way, our ability to richly and deeply conceive of the world as actually being some way and to subject that conception to rational considerations provides us access to modal space, to the space of metaphysical possibility. If a state of affairs conceived as actual can withstand the scrutiny of reason without revealing logical contradictions, that is simply what it means to judge a state of affairs possible. Or to put it still more clearly, if you can dream it, you can do it in the sense that it is metaphysically possible in some world, if not necessarily in the one we or anyone ever will inhabit. From there, Chalmers provides an ingenious, if not knockdown, argument for the relation of some cases of primary conceivability, imagining other ways in which the world might have been, to some cases of what he calls secondary possibility, imagining the way that we have fixed certain facts about the world and that things could be otherwise. The text cases are, perhaps unsurprisingly, the knowledge argument and the zombie argument. That is to say that the question that Chalmers is interested in is deeply related to the one that Ritalik and Beer both ask, whether our ability to conceive of a world in which physical facts and consciousness can be pried apart imaginatively can lead us to the metaphysical conclusion that physicalism is false. Chalmers argues that it can. And this would indeed be a powerful and elegant outcome if we were to credit it. It would go a certain distance toward confirming some of the fondest dreams of the poetic imagination. But if we were to credit it, we would also have to acknowledge that this power of access to possibility comes at a price. Salvaging the probative force of conceivability requires that in the vast majority of cases, we are thinking of possibility as a purely a priori notion with no necessary bearing on the world as we actually have it. So there are two questions. First, what would poetry invested in the idea of metaphysical possibility look like? Fortunately, I'm approaching the end of my time as I approach the limits of my answers, but I will say a few things. One of the most interesting things about Chalmers' argument is the role that imagination plays in it. This amounts, I'm suggesting, to a theory of the imagination. This is why it's worthwhile for us to pay attention to it. For a proposition to be positively conceivable on his account, it must be susceptible to what he calls coherent modal imagining. That is, we must be able to imagine a situation fully enough, whether as a perceptual image or as a conceptual structure, that it can be taken to verify the proposition so that no contradictions appear within it no matter what level of detail we add to it. The idea that this is precisely what poets are up to is an idea of long standing in poetological thought. Only the poet, disdaining to be tied to any such subjection, lifted up with the vigor of his own invention, doth grow in effect another nature in making things either better than nature bringeth forth or quite anew forms such as never were in nature as the heroes, demigods, chimeras, furies, and such like. So as he goeth hand in hand with nature, not enclosed within the narrow warrant of her gifts, but freely ranging only within the zodiac of his own wit. Nature never set forth the earth in so rich a tapestry as diverse poets have done. Her world is brazen. The poets only deliver a golden. If we were interested in seeing poets pursue their art into a realm in which their wits might entail some epistemic privilege, we might begin to take a renewed interest in genres that subject their projects of world building, not to realist considerations, but to rational ones. And I'm thinking here less of lyric than of allegory and of epic. While it may not make sense to ask of Shakespeare 
how many children had Lady Macbeth. It does make sense to ask of Milton whether he has succeeded in creating a scenario in which human freedom is logically consistent with divine omnipotence. Asking the question of whether paradise lost is the conceiving of a scenario in which the former disallows or requires the latter is not necessarily to insist that Milton has properly accessed modal space. We can disagree about what conclusions to draw about the world as presented by Paradise Lost. But it is to acknowledge that the divine epic has modal ambitions. It means to make claims about whether the reconciliation of two ideas is metaphysically possible. That some readers have understood Milton to have foundered in his presentation of divinity upon a logical inconsistency and demonstrated the incoherence of that position is potentially as useful an experimental outcome as any. The golden worlds of poetic conception produced by the hand-in-hand -hand alliance of wit and nature may not be probable. Indeed, in the vast majority of cases, they will never and could never turn out to be actual. But they may indeed be possible. If modal rationalism is right, they must be possible. And in the assertion of such possibility lies a greater claim to knowledge than might be dreamed of in any anti-philosophy. On the other hand, and this is the last hand, it may well be the case that our consideration of how to get what we thought we wanted out of experimental poems, a form of conception that counts as strongly bearing on the knowledge of what is possible, shows us that we were wrong to want what we wanted. If possibility is, as it were, a merely metaphysical notion, then possibility, however impressive a cognitive achievement, might turn out not to matter to us at all. Or to put it another way, given what is required to think about the kinds of imagining that could produce real experimental dividends, poetry is, by and large, not experimental, nor should we wish it to be. It might be for the purposes of art, that the knowledge that matters most to us is not knowledge of how a world could be, but of how it is. And for this, poetry is no better guide than anything else. We may thus be inclined to relinquish the idea that the imagination provides us access to any sort of knowledge, but this would also involve abandoning the pathos that comes from imagining it as reason's better alternative. Thank you.